Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. We are glad that you are here today as we celebrate the festival of God's creation. We recognize that we as God's people are called to care for the earth and to do that well as we honor and serve God. Would you join with me in prayer this morning? We praise you, O Lord, for the plants growing in the earth and water, for the life inhabiting lakes and seas, for the life creeping in the soils and the land, for all creatures living. We give thanks for the ways that you have worked and created. All of your works are wonderful, God, and we confess that we have not taken good care of your creation. Help us, Lord, as we offer our repentance. Help us to promise to care for your creation as a gracious gift, to remember that it has been entrusted to us by you, our God. And help us today as we promise anew to be good stewards. Help us as we seek to serve you and honor you, our creator. Amen. Amen. Come, let us dwell in God's shelter. Let us dwell in God's work of art. God of wonder beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. Come because the earth is the Lord and God's. Earth is our home. We live in God's world. We are not alone. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. We share this life with the heavens and the earth, with the waters and the land, with the trees and the grasses, with the furs, fish, birds, and animals, with creatures from every form, and with all of our brothers and sisters. God is good, and everything God makes is good. God is love, and everything God makes is love's fruit. Let us worship God. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. Would you join with me in prayer? Almighty God, we grumble and complain about our daily lives. We read the newspapers and we watch the news and we moan about the evil that seems to flourish in our world. And we wonder, where are you? We turn our backs to the needs of the poor and give only a cursory acknowledgement of their plight. We throw up our hands in the air and, is act, and act as though we are defeated. We cry out, why isn't God taking care of this? Forgive us this day, patient Lord. Forgive our arrogance and our ignorance and our pettiness. Forgive us when we could have done something to help someone else, but chose instead to turn away. Forgive our attitudes and language and our thoughts and actions that have gone against your will. You are with us, Lord. 
You lead us daily in right paths and you offer us the bread and life. You stand with us in times of trial and in your presence, our cup runneth over. We ask, Lord, that today you would help us to trust you, help us to praise you, and to remember all of the ways you call us to be your witness and your workers in the world. Give us strength and courage and joy for all the work to which you have called us to do. And now we pray the prayer Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let me go. 
23, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths. For his name's sake, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Today for our children's sermon, I have a picture painted from Haiti. You all know that I have a heart for Haiti and have gotten to travel to Haiti many different times. And I remember one of the first times I was there. Now in Haiti, there is no central septic system, no real sewer, no real way to collect and dispose of trash. And so what happens is this beautiful land that is both the mountains and the sea that has this rich soil, this beautiful earth is just destroyed by all kinds of trash everywhere. One of the women who was on the mission service team with me was going around our community picking up trash. And I remember that one of the boys in the community asked her why she was doing that. And she said, it's important for us to care for the earth because this is God's gift to us. Now that was the first time he had ever heard somebody say that the earth was a gift from God. And we are supposed to treat gifts with special privilege, like they're precious. When somebody gives us a gift, we're supposed to honor it and remember the energy and effort that went into picking it and thinking about it. And so she challenged the boy that every time he had trash to think about how he could treat the earth like a gift from God. Now, we live here in a different community, in a different place, where we have a high value on recycling, and we have the blessing of running water and septic systems, where we're reminded of the importance of not littering. But we, too, have a responsibility to treat the earth like a gift. Think this week about ways that you can honor the gift that God has given us, this beautiful world, and the ways that we can treat it with grace and with mercy and with love. Would you pray with me as we pray for the children of our church? Gracious God, we thank you for this beautiful gift you have given us of your creation. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to remember to treat this gift with love and respect. For in honoring the earth, we honor you. Help us this week see ways that we can care for the beauty and bounty of your creation. And bless these children and all the children of the world. For they are the ones who inherit the earth. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 24. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother and sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts and rest at his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives with him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us and we know it by the spirit he gave us. This morning, as we gather around God's holy word together, we continue in this sermon series called Now What? as we were reminded that the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. Today, we hear the call to have a faith that is about doing, more than just believing, about doing. But before we begin, let's spend a moment in prayer together. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks for this day you have made and the chance to gather around your word. We thank you for the reminder that we are called to action as we care for the poor, as we care for your creation, as we care for one another in need. 
Help us to hear and to experience your word and hide me, Lord, behind the cross and the tomb so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. Our rock, our redeemer. Amen. Amen. I, I'm a bad line picker. It's genetic. My mom is a bad line picker. My grandmother was a bad line picker. You know what I mean, but when I say bad line picker, we can be anywhere at a concert, at the movie theaters, at the grocery store. And if I pick the line, it is gonna take forever for us to get up to the front. It doesn't matter where it is. It happens every single time. And it happened to me last week. I was just running into the grocery store for a few items. My day was already too full. I didn't have a lot of time. I needed to get in and get out. And I don't know why I thought that would happen. It never does, right? And it was like the cashier was going in slow motion at this like glacial pace. I just kept waiting and waiting for something to happen for her to actually put the groceries in the bag of the person in front of me. And I watched as they had this kind of conversation, the cashier and the customer, almost every single item she picked up as she scanned it slowly, they'd kind of have this conversation. And I am really convicted that one of the places I least reflect Christ, one of the places I am the worst reflection of someone who knows and loves Christ is waiting in these terrible lines that I pick because I got more and more frustrated as I felt it kind of well up in me, this anger. I decided that it didn't matter what the cashier did. When it was my turn, I was gonna say nothing, grab my groceries and just go. And then it was finally my turn. As I moved in front of the cashier, I could tell even behind her mask that she had been crying. She began to tell me that that woman, the customer before me had been so kind. She said that she was in the process of helping her mom move into an assisted living facility and that it was wearing down on her mentally, emotionally, physically. And she noticed that the woman had a tag, uh, an employee tag from assisted living in our community, not the same one her mom was going to, but. Nevertheless, when the cashier said that this is where she was and the guilt and worry and uncertainty she was feeling around her mother, the woman took the time to comfort her. She began to assure her that she was making the right choice, that it was hard, but that her mom would be okay, that she was sure her mother would know that she loved her, that even in this action, there could be love and grace and that she wasn't failing just because she couldn't take care of her alone at home anymore. And as she put my last item in the bag and my total appeared on the screen, the cashier said to me, what a witness. What a witness. The conviction of my spirit that sometimes happens at the grocery store, the movement of God that happens even at the grocery store, the reminder that God is indeed working here and now, even at the grocery store. First John, along with second and third John are called epistles, they're called letters, but they really don't have the same kind of form and frame as the other epistles in our book. Some scholars think that it's more like they're a sermon or some sort of religious tract that were passed out, but whatever its original text or purpose, First John in particular is intending for the Christian believers to be united in the midst of their division. Woven throughout 1 John is this clear call to embody the love of God. Now, isn't that perfect, right? After last week's sermon. If you didn't have a chance to watch Pastor Kirsten's sermon last week on embodiment, I really challenge you to go back and watch the video. It was a really powerful reminder that the bodily resurrection of Jesus means that bodies matter, that God doesn't just care about our mind or about our soul, but that God cares about our physical bodies and the physical bodies of others and the way we treat and care for and reach out in concern for the physical bodies of others matter too. This theme of embodiment is carried throughout 1 John as well, as we're challenged to see that the way we reflect God's love and grace is not something that happens alone in our minds or in our spirits or souls, but instead something that can happen and should happen in our very bodies the way we live out our faith. First John and the Gospel of John have a similar language. And just like in the Gospel of John, this need to live out faith is rooted in the way that Jesus embodied God's love for the world in his very flesh. 
in his very actions, in his very death and his resurrection, Jesus is the embodiment of love. And so we, as a people of faith, are called to be an embodiment of love too. And verse 17 holds nothing back. There is no room for negotiation. John is very clear that instead of faith happening in words or in speech, it has to be in truth and in action. There's no negotiation here. Several years ago, the year that Bethany was born, for Mother's Day, my family got me two fruit trees to plant in the parsonage. Now, I am definitely not a gardener, and I can't tell you anything about these trees other than one was cherry and one was pear. Now, I'm sure some of you could tell the difference by the bark, by the way they grow, by the leaves. I don't know. Aren't those things that can tell you the difference between trees? And I'm sure some of you would have had the presence of mind to remember where you were planting them, but I'm going to blame the mommy brain. I have no idea, had no idea which tree was where. And honestly, I, I had to wait, and I had to wait, and I had to wait for the fruit because the fruit was the only way I could tell these two trees apart, which was a pear tree and which was a cherry tree. The fruit was the only way I could tell the difference between these trees, and fruit takes a long time growing on fruit trees. It wasn't until the actual pears and the actual cherries started to grow that I knew where the trees were and exactly what they are. The fruit matters. The author of 1 John is very clear. Words and speech mean nothing without truth, without action. If we're not living out our faith in a tangible, embodied way, if we aren't bearing fruit, then our faith is hollow and fragile. In her reflection on this, Claudia Highball writes, the lessons here are clear in this text. Intentions and words are not acts of loving response. Intentions and words are not enough. Faith isn't good thoughts. Faith is action. Service to those in need, caring for the poor and vulnerable, learning directly from the life of Jesus who was willing to lay down his life in love for others. And the way that this plays out every day is found in all kinds of ordinary actions where we choose to embody the love and grace of Jesus Christ. I got to witness some of that this week. This week, Miss Sue, one of our amazing Kids Club staff members, came into the church office and she began to tell us of her morning. She had gotten up early and gone for a walk with her dog and had found this set of keys in her neighborhood. And while she looked all around where they were for the owner, she could not find them. She had posted it online, seeking the person who they belonged to. She had even called the company of, of the tag that was on the keys, trying to figure out who these keys belonged to, knowing that losing your keys completely messes up your day. And then after she was done working at Kids Club, she spent her entire afternoon and her entire evening tracking down the owners of the key and returning them to them. Talk about an embodiment of love for the sake of others. She set aside her needs, her desire, her afternoon, her time, her energy, her effort, so that somebody else might be able to experience God's grace and mercy through the embodiment of God's love. Brandon Robertson writes, Christianity is about doing far more than believing. While we spend a lifetime of learning and growing and discerning, living like we love Jesus, living like we've been transformed by the Holy Spirit, living like the living God is transforming our very lives is not something that has to wait. My hope and my prayer for us this week is that we will hear the words of 1 John as a convicting call for us to see the needs of others in our midst that we will hear these words and choose love, choose sacrifice, choose to embody Christ for the world. For faith is something that is lived out in the way we love our families, the way we treat our neighbors, the way we care for the earth, the way we speak justice and hope and promise, the way we listen and comfort a cashier at the grocery store. May we choose to embody love. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, we confess that it is hard sometimes for us to see how we might be able to share your love and truth. And yet today you remind us, Lord, it is about the way we live our lives. May our very lives bear fruit, proclaim your love and hope, embody your truth and promise, 
and offer your grace for the world. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. And now a blessing for you. As you go, may you go in peace. May you go with God's peace and wherever you go and as best you can, go to share and to spread that peace. Amen. Amen.